Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Health Wire show. My name is Jason Berry, and I'm the editor of Digital Health Wire and the host of the show. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Brittany Harrell, who is the head of information security at Nabla. We're going to be talking about what's probably the topic of the year, and that's ambient AI. In particular, we're going to be looking at AI governance and where it stands in healthcare today. Brittany, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm so happy to be here. Now, before we get too into the weeds here, could you maybe kick things off with a little bit of background on Nabla and on yourself too, for anyone who might not be familiar? Yeah, so Nabla is an ambient AI scribe. So we are what the physicians and the clinicians have in you know, the physician room, the operating room to make their lives easier. Ultimately, we're here to reduce their burnout by being able to take appropriate clinical notes and follow-ups for patients. Um, prior to Nabla, I have always existed in the healthcare industry. It's AI healthcare is a little bit new for me. Um, but before that, I was in the revenue and cost management space and the payment processing space of healthcare. So, um, and as we all know, the U.S. healthcare market is incredibly intricate. So hopefully I can, you know, use a lot of that knowledge to help further what we're doing here at Nabla. All right. Perfect. Now, one of the big things that I'm really looking forward to chatting with you about today is Nabla's recent white paper that's basically a checklist for selecting the right ambient AI scribe for your organization, while also making sure that strong AI governance is really embedded within that selection process. To maybe set the stage for that, could you just give us a little bit of an intro to what exactly is AI governance and what's the current state of things in U.S. healthcare? Yeah, I mean, AI governance is such an interesting space. AI in and of itself is still relatively new, so therefore so is AI governance. There's no what I would call federal mandate when it comes to governance. So how you define AI governance is very dependent on each of your organizations. Um, for me, I would say it's multiple parts, which I know we're going to get into with the checklist, but it's definitely in the security realm in terms of data protection. But it's also around how you're using that data, um, how you're training your models, if you're looking for biases and making sure that your data is used, being used ethically. That's all in the AI governance space. And I think some of the forefront technologies and organizations that are establishing these AI governance frameworks, as I would say, are kind of the more industry leading because there isn't a, a federally or nationally recognized version yet. With how quickly AI burst onto the scene and how quickly it's still being developed and deployed, what are some of the overarching goals that we can hope to achieve with a strong governance framework? And do you think that's possible just given how fast uh, this space is still continuously evolving? I mean, definitely. There are a lot of organizations out there. Chai, for example, which we recently joined, um, which is an AI coalition. There, there's a lot of organizations that are starting to get together and talk about what does good AI governance look like. So I think a lot of people are interested in this space. I mean, I'm a security professional by heart, so AI is very exciting for me, but I'm also worried about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. So what AI looks like in terms of good practices right now is one, having strong communication. Um, so documenting your practices, being transparent about your practices, that's huge. And then everything down to data, how you protect data, what you do with that data, how you store it, how you use it. That is truly the world of AI governance and kind of where we're going. And I do think that we will continue to mature in that space. Beautiful. I think that brings us straight to the checklist, um, which will also be linked in the show notes for everyone to find. But if I am a clinical leader, a chief digital officer at a hypothetical health system, and I'm looking at an ambient AI deployment to help out my clinicians, make sure that I'm addressing staff burnout, all that good stuff, um, what are some of the things that I should be looking out for to make sure that a strong AI governance framework is in place and that it's really part of my overall strategy? Yeah, I mean, really good question. So again, there's there's multiple aspects of, of AI governance. The first part that you wanna to look to is of course security and privacy. What do these organizations do? 
Um, how do they store their data? How long do they store their data? Do they even need to store patient data? Um, as we all know, there's a lot of breaches going on in the world right now, especially in the healthcare space. So as much as you can limit that patient data interaction and storage, that's a really big key area to look for. And also, if you run into an organization who's not even willing to share that information, it's a bit of a red flag mm -hmm. uh, because we are just in this world now where you kind of do have to have all of the checks and balances. Um, another space is, again, what they do with that data. So do they train their model on your data? If so, what types of data are they training on? Do they have outside entities looking at their models and verifying that there's no biases? Um, that's hard because, you know, we as a, a collective United States <laughs> are very diverse. Um, and so when you're taking all that data and making sure that you're not implicating the AI model, uh, you have to be able to show proof of that. So not only say that you're doing it, but how you're doing it. And then the last piece, and you know, this is less in the data space and less in the tech space, is just being open and transparent, um, having strong customer relationships. If someone says, hey, I need you to walk me through the A to Z of what starts on my side as a clinician versus what ends up in your storage, you should be able to answer all of that because that helps provide trust and transparency for these clinicians who to be honest, have enough to worry about. Um, they should not have to worry about, is my patient data protected? And is this device that I'm using going to be safe with this technology, all of that. All of those components that you just mentioned sound so important and sound so important to get right. And yet it also seems like a lot to tackle for some of these teams at health systems that might not have a ton of extra bandwidth. Um, how much of the onus of ensuring strong governance lands on the health system or the provider organization versus the vendor? Like, does Noble make sure that these practices are baked into its solutions or is it up to the health system to kind of make sure that this all gets incorporated? You know, I think it's both. Um, there's there's obviously heavy reliance on the organization that you're going to go with, like NABLA. You know, it's our responsibility to continuously be updating our practices, staying up to date with good AI governance frameworks, um, constantly communicating, like with this white paper and with our trust page and our security page. Um, NABLA is very unique in the industry that we only store data for 14 days, which is a very small amount of time. We do that because of security and privacy protections. Um, so communicating why that is, letting the clinicians know all of that's really important. But at the same time, I think it's also necessary for the vendors, like if you're looking at someone like NABLA, to really look at them. If you're weighing people against each other, you really wanna know all of the details and kind of line all of that information up together mm -hmm. to say, who do I think is you know, going to protect me? Who do I think can communicate well if, you know, knock on wood, I hate saying out loud, if they were to have an incident. Mm -hmm. um, that's really important for these health systems to look at. And unfortunately it's hard sometimes because sometimes they have smaller teams um, that's why I also think it's important for organizations like NABLA to be kind of what I would call an advisor. So mm -hmm. we definitely have clients that come to us and say, you know, we're new to setting up an AI governance structure. What would be your recommendation? Mm -hmm. And we enjoy that because it's like, hey, yeah, we we are doing the same thing. Um, I, I call it the collaborative AI governance space, which I think you kind of have to be in such a volatile market right now. So you mentioned a lot about the data privacy, the security, uh, the validation, all of that is super important. But what about the outputs themselves, uh, ensuring that they're consistent, ensuring that we're avoiding biases? What are some of the things that should be on people's checklists when it comes to ensuring output reliability and things along those lines? Yeah, I mean, also great question. So it comes down to, again, what I asked before is what are they doing with my data and what kind of data are they using? So NABLA is also very unique that by default, we don't use our clients' data to train 
um, our model, we actually started as a clinician practice and we used that data to start building our model, which is very unique. Um, and I say that because, you know, it, it comes down to that data and privacy protection. You do not want all of your data being used free reign. I mean, think about all of the information that we put in chat GPT and technically chat GPT can do whatever they want with it. Um, so you definitely want to check how are they training their models? What types of data are they using? How are they continuously learning and growing? But you also want to look at um, how an organization uses product feedback for enhancements. And that is another thing that Nabla does. So every encounter that our clinicians have, they're able to provide feedback. And it can be as small as, you know, hey, this word did not transcribe appropriately or I want to see the format in this way. And that's how you continuously learn and improve. And, and, improve. Uh, and so that's where it comes back to that client relationship, client engagement of how can you continuously enhance the product based on clinician needs. You know, there's a lot of specialties out there. Some specialties need notes generated in a specific way just because of how they interact with their patients. And that's where that information goes into the product lifestyle and how important that is. Could you maybe give an example of one of the partnerships that you've had where you worked alongside clinicians to either tailor the model or fine tune the solution to their specific use case? Yeah, absolutely. So pediatrics is an, an industry that I am not super familiar with. And we have a client that we worked with closely in the pediatric space. So when you're going to the doctor and you think about yourself as an adult, you know, the first questions that they'll get down to as an adult is what are your symptoms? You know, what kind of medication do you take? Well, you can't do that with a child because that's not how they communicate. So in the pediatrics world, a lot of the information that gets derived out of that encounter is based on their behaviors at school. And, you know, are they throwing tantrums, which, you know, I think probably all children do. Um, and sometimes the parents are speaking, but sometimes the child is speaking. And all of that context matters into the into what you're diagnosing with. Um, but you can't treat a pediatric appointment like you can with a primary physician. So we had to work closely with our client to kind of build that subject matter and to understand what context of the clinical note was really important. Um, and, and that's where the specialties come in because everything is so unique and the US healthcare market is so wide, specialties are so wide. And that's why it's also important to work closely with your clients to understand the intricacies of their day to days. And just given how wide the industry is and how many different specialties are within it, do you think that a universal framework is something that's actually achievable or might that be out of reach? I know that Europe recently rolled out something along those lines. Is that something that we're moving towards in the U.S. as well? And if so, where do you think we are along that timeline? Ooh, that is a question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that was a question. That I was do a question. think that a universal framework is possible, kind of like HIPAA, but I think there's always going to be intricacies, regardless of the industry that you're in, that you have to think about. And this is very much how I feel about security. You can follow a framework, a best practice, an audit, a certification. That's great. That's important to check the box to make sure that you're doing the basics, but you always need to go above and beyond that. And so I think in the AI governance space, even if they do produce, uh, you know, what I would call U.S. framework, which I do not believe will happen in 2025, unfortunately, um, I think there will be state level regulations, though. But even if that were to happen, you still need things like AI governance committees and coalitions to continuously hone in on that space that you're in and also collaborate with industry experts because AI is moving faster than we are. And while we're on the topic of coalitions, I think you mentioned at the top of the interview that Nabla recently joined Chai. Could you maybe share a little bit about the decision to join and maybe give a bit of a background on Chai? 
Yeah, so CHAI is kind of a coalition like we described. It's a multitude of organizations coming together um, along with researchers in the industry of AI to really talk through the next phase of what AI governance looks like. Um, Nava thought it was important because, you know, we can look at ourselves continuously, we can look at our own processes, but we also want that external feedback. We want an external auditor to really look at our environment. We want to make sure that we're collaborating with new frameworks that are coming out, understanding what that looks like, and providing input of what we've seen in our space as well. And that's why I think groups like Achai or any kind of coalition or working group is super important especially in the AI space because of how fast it moves. And as someone so close to the ground and seeing how fast this space is developing, uh, what are some of the high notes or things that you are most excited about regarding AI? Uh, what are some of the things that our audience has to look forward to as the space kind of keeps developing? Yeah, I mean, I love AI, but I'm a tech nerd. So, I'm, <laughs> you know, probably... <laughs> On the outside, but as a security professional, you know, we do have to be careful with how fast AI grows. I always use it as like the internet of things and I'm going to age myself with this now because um, I was in the generation of dial up, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't think about, you know, what it would be like if we were to have the internet at our fingertips and that's our reality now. And it's awesome. You know, if I need to Google something in two seconds, I can. But also, we are now in a society where social media rules our worlds. Um, we have news overload because we can get access to information in any capacity. You kind of have to think about AI in the same way. Um, you know, what you're going to build will have implications in the future. I'm most excited about what I would call the space that Nabla is in, which is reducing that administrative burden, not just in healthcare, but even for me. Like, you know, they've, they've started developing tools that can look for phishing emails. Well, I would love to not have to go spend half of my day looking through that and a tool can do it for me. So I can focus on things to be more strategic. That's where products like Nabla comes in, where our clinicians can really focus on what they got into, um, you know, physician space for and medical space, which is to treat patients. Um, but, you know, and then I see like the self-driving cars and I'm like, okay, well, maybe we should be a little bit careful with that. So I think we have to, as a society, think about what is the future so we do not become a minority report situation. If anybody's seen that movie, if you know. Oh, it's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always try to wrap these up with a Tom Cruise reference. So that's actually just perfect timing. Um, <laughs> Brittany, it's been great having you on the show. Um, it's also been really great seeing the data come out from the work that you've been doing and just seeing how much you're helping clinicians actually cut down on the parts of practicing medicine that aren't actually practicing medicine um, and spending patient visits actually with patients. So it's been fantastic to see. Um, thanks for walking us through the checklist. Again, people can find that in the show notes and we'll catch you next time. Brittany, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Jason. It was a pleasure. All right, folks, this has been the Digital Health Wire show. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.